Welcome to the Talent Grow Show, where you can get actionable, results-oriented insight and advice on how to take your leadership, communication, and people skills to the next level and become the kind of leader people want to follow. And now, your host and leadership development strategist, Haleli Azulai. Welcome back to the Talent Grow Show. This is Halalia Zulai. I'm your leadership development strategist, and this time I am interviewing my friend and colleague, Doug Hench, who is a certified executive coach who has a lot of very diverse experience and has really made a big career transformation several years ago. And he talks about that transformation right at the beginning of our conversation and, and how actually reading a book has really changed the entire trajectory of his career, bringing him to where he is today, which is researching positive psychology and ways that people can become uh, happier and enjoy greater well-being and more importantly, more resilient. But he doesn't just research it. What he does is he translates it into the language that people in business talk. And he coaches people and facilitates workshops around how to bring all of the great juicy bits of information that we get from the field of positive psychology and especially on resilience into the world of work. At the end of the conversation, Doug also shares a couple of tips about how to get the front door and the back door to more resilience. So I hope that you will enjoy this conversation. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, I really welcome your feedback and requests. So at the end, leave me a comment. And if you like this episode, please share it with a friend. Please give us a rating on iTunes and or just do something to let us know how we're doing here because that's the way that we can bring even more value to you and everyone else who listens. So enjoy this conversation and thanks for tuning in. Welcome back to the Talent Grow Show. I'm happy to be here with my friend Doug Hench, who is an expert on positive psychology and bringing all of the wealth of the research of positive psychology to the workplace. Doug is a certified executive coach, and Doug and I actually have met because he also facilitates a lot of workshops like I do, and we have a client in common that we often work side by side and sometimes even together. So I've had the opportunity of working with Doug lots of times and uh, getting to know him. He's a great guy, and I really look forward to speaking with him today and for you to learn more from Doug. Doug, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Lily. Great to be here. Awesome. So I always think that it's very interesting to hear how people meander through life and find themselves where they are in their journey, because it seems like it's never a very prescribed or one, one size fits all kind of way. And it also helps people get a little bit of a sense of who you are through your, your words. So if you don't mind, in a very short amount of time, can you distill down your professional journey? Where did you start? Where have you been and how did you get to here? Yeah, good question. So I have done everything from be a college football coach to a substitute teacher to selling payroll services for a major firm in the United States and a couple of things in between there, product management, corporate trainer, instructional designer, all these things. And it was a book for me. Uh, it was actually Now Discover Your Strength. Oh, so I started reading that uh, probably 10, 11 years ago. That got me really thinking differently about what was important and what I wanted to do. And, you know, next thing you know, I'm just following my strengths and my passions. And here I am working for myself, living the dream. Wow. Well, that's really fantastic. And I think that a lot of people experience that, you know, having some kind of an epiphany or a book or, or something like that, that triggers maybe some soul searching or, or exploration and possibly a detour. But I can't imagine how you go from reading a book to living the dream. So it, I'm sure that it wasn't that simple and, and easy. So can, I don't want to go too deep into it, but can you share maybe how did you know, how did you know that you were ready to make that kind of a change and what did you do first? The first thing I did was I bought the book for the team I was managing and, you know, this, this was back in a time, and, and it still happens in organizations, right? You buy a book, someone thinks who moved my cheese is the greatest thing ever, and they buy it for the whole company. 
and nobody does anything with it. Well, I bought the book. We ended up running. We ran a little workshop with it, and I could tell something was different with the team I was leading. And we actually had somebody observing us, and he was, believe it or not, doing a project for his master's in organization development, and he came up to me and said, Doug, this is magic. This is crazy. So the next thing you know, I actually created a full-day workshop and I implemented it. I got lucky again with the merger. I was at a telecom that was bought by another big telecom. And I flew around the country using that strengths workshop as an integration team building device. And it was working so well that someone came up to me one day at my desk and he was the guy that measured everything for our internal university, whether the training worked or not, and you know, attend, everything from attendance to engagement to business uh, ROI. And he looked at me, he's holding a piece of paper, I'll never forget it. And he said, Doug, you know, you could sell this one day. <laughs> so it actually was a lot easier than you think. And I took the steps, uh, I got in touch with a bunch of people, you know, I, I kept talking about this stuff. And the next thing you know, a good friend of mine was running a small company that Marty Seligman was a consultant for. And the next thing you know, I was running that small company for about three years and I got really hooked into the whole positive psych community. And then, then I went off and did my own thing after that. Wow. What a cool story. So let's just by just to make sure that we don't leave anybody behind people that are not big positive psychology geeks like us might not know who Marty Seligman is. So he is considered the father of positive psychology. And he, he's a professor at the uh, University of Pennsylvania that kind of kicked off this entire new faction in the world of psychology that instead of looking at disorder or, dis or disruption or, or what's wrong with people in terms of psychology and how to fix people, it kind of looks at what's right with people and how to help them flourish. Would you, would you say that's a good description? Absolutely. Yep. And getting a chance to work with him was magical. You know, him, he, he, Marty and others and other top names in the field as well. It was, uh, I think you nailed it. Yes. Oh, cool. Well, yeah, that is a really cool um, opportunity. I love that because and people just never, you know, if you can't really cook this thing up, you know, you, you can't prescribe it. It's just being interested, curious, following your curiosity and your passion and being open to opportunities. And, and then they just sort of present themselves in ways that you would have never been able to predict. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. A lot Very of obstacles cool. and, you know, a lot of obstacles in between. It didn't happen overnight. No. There was a lot of hard work and a lot of mistakes and, and other things. And, yeah. But it was, it's been a great journey. And, and I think that the other lesson that listeners can really take from this, because a lot of times people are looking for how do I make a transition? If I realize that there's something I want to change, um, how do I make a transition? You know, I've got responsibilities. I've got a mortgage to pay. I got, you know, people to feed and so on. And it just sounds like from, you know, and again, I, I can't dig too deep into it right now and the amount of time we have together. But it sounds from your story like you you didn't just sort of jump off the deep end. You built this bridge, right? You just sort of found a way to to merge what you were already doing with something that you discovered you could do. And that created sort of this like launching pad into this other world. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit of both. Actually, I built the bridge in the beginning. And then when our happiness company came across the great recession, that unfortunately, you know, went away. And mm -hmm. that's when I had to jump. And that's when I decided not to go back to corporate or work for somebody else. That's when I went out on my own. And that's when, you know, we're looking at a full year of not having a lot of business, almost no business for a good nine or 10 months. And, but wow. just staying with it because I knew it was the right thing to do. It's a mix of opportunity and courage. So we are both. Yeah. And we need that to be successful. So cool. And I'm glad that Agreed. you stuck with it because you're doing such good work and you are extremely successful now. So yay. Now, the, the ideas that are in the world of positive psychology, there's so many, so many good ideas. And I know that you kind of are bringing what is in the research, because I know that you love to read and, and explore what's going on in the research. But I think that what you do so well and what brings so much value is that you're able to translate it and, and make it applied by bringing into the world of business. And, and you've been doing a lot of coaching. So is there a story that really stands out to you where a coaching client or just in general, somebody you worked with or maybe a team you worked with, or a company that you worked with 
really made a big shift as a result of implementing something that you taught them that came from this, this uh, massive amounts of research in positive psychology. Could you share that story? Yeah. You know, in fact, it comes from that strengths research. Uh, that's the first thing that comes to mind. There's another, another thing comes to mind, but I, when it comes to what really jumps out, there was, uh, I kind of stumbled across it in, during the merger with these two great companies where you had company A on one side and company B on the other side. And here I was facilitating this workshop for this retail organization uh, who was coming together and they had very different ideas, very different personalities, very different cultures. And they flew me out to California. In fact, I'll never forget we were in Napa, Napa Valley and this wonderful bed and breakfast uh, with these really tight quarters. It wasn't ideal for a corporate training, but it was a nice setting. And we had them all take the uh, via strengths, the values in action strengths survey, which I can share at the end Good. in terms of the, uh, the URL and so forth. And everybody took it. And we did this one thing. And I had set it up as, hey, I'm going to teach you about strengths. That was the real the mindset I was in. And I stumbled across this one activity that just popped into my head, which was, I had people go around the room and name what they thought was the top strengths of their colleagues. So mm -hmm. if you were sitting all the way to my left, Haleli, I said, hey, Haleli, tell me, tell us, tell the group what you think your top strengths are well, out of your top five, because everyone had the spreadsheet. Everyone knew, saw what everyone else had, how they had come out on the test. And you said, well, you know, I actually think love of learning is my top strength. Um, and here's how I use it at work. And then the person seated to your left would say, you know, Haleli, you know, that, that's a really good one, but I'll be honest with you, your capacity to love and be loved, that's the one I see every day at work. You constantly show up and just connect with people and you're concerned for their health. And then the next person goes and the next person goes. And we went around this room and here we are with this team that had, and they were giving real examples. This wasn't made up stuff. This was rooted in, this, this had one foot in the science and one foot in experience. Hmm. And the, emo the positive emotions in the room were absolutely unbelievable. And, we, you know, what's funny is I had thought, hey, this will be like a 20-minute activity. We did it for about two and a half hours for a <laughs> team of 12 people. Wow. And, uh, you know, the, we, we took a break, of course, in the middle of that. And the leader of the team came up to me and I said, hey, just so you know, we're way behind because <laughs> I know we have dinner reservations today. And she goes, I really don't give a crap. <laughs> Keep going. This is awesome. And I've brought this to several other very dysfunctional teams over the years. You know, whether you're dysfunctional or not is, you know, that's not a prerequisite, <laughs> but some really dysfunctional teams. You know what? I'm not telling you that it fixes the problems. What it does is it creates just enough positivity. And, th and Barbara Fredrickson at the University of uh, North Carolina, who does a lot of work in, pos in, in emotions, period, but positive emotions in particular, mm -hmm. she talks about positive emotions being the seeds of resilience. And you need to plant those. And then, and then the team, of course, has to then go work in their strengths and, and challenge each other in, in um, uh, collaborative ways. And there's a lot more to it. But at least you, you, that's the first step on the ladder in a way. Cool. So... You're saying that it created positivity. Would you say that's the main thing, the main benefit that it delivered, or did it help them figure out new ways to work with each other also? I think it was both. I think it was and. There was so much positive emotion in the room that they opened their mind. Their minds were then open to how they could work with each other differently. And when they heard about Steve or Mary really liking to get into the nitty gritty details of things, well, then magically they started to talk about things they didn't like to do. And people started actually handing off assignments. They started partnering with each other. And you started to see these little teams create, these informal teams, and then it propelled them into doing more of what they all loved to do. And people were less stressed out. They were more in their comfort zones, and they were more likely to collaborate. Cool. You mentioned resilience. I know that that's a big passion of yours. And um, you, you, uh, I know that you probably work a lot with organizations about how to develop more resilience in the leaders and in employees. So 
what what are some of the core skills you think are the most important for developing resilience? Maybe you can define resilience first. How do you define it? And then what are the things people need to do to become more resilient? Yeah, of course. I, I think resilience, do, you know, has to do with how we deal with adversity. And but it's also being motivated by challenges, connecting with other people and learning from your mistakes. Uh, you know, the dictionary definition is really going to focus on things like bouncing back, right, and elasticity, coming back to your original state, things mm-hmm. like that. I think resilience is a lot richer and deeper concept. And I think it takes, it can help propel you forward as well when we think about it usually just as bouncing back. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're not just coming right back to where you were before. You're, you're coming farther. Yeah. In fact, there's a, there's a, there's some research now pointing to the concept of post-traumatic stress growth. I mean, we've all heard about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, where we've got, you know, particularly our, our military are dealing with things like that, you know, with long deployments and, of course, really difficult, you know, war circumstances and so forth. Uh, other people get it from terrorist attacks and, you know, violent crime and so forth. But we also know that there's a certain number of people who grow out of these situations mm-hmm. and actually propel forward as well. Yeah. Oh, it makes me think of that old cliche proverb, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Maybe it's true after all. You know, my dad used to say that to me after we would lose a high school basketball game or I didn't get to play as much as I wanted. (laughs) And I would just grind my teeth and, and, you know, not want to listen to him. And I find myself saying that same exact statement to my kids. (laughs) <laughs> There's a long list of things I find myself saying that my mother and, and yeah. dad used to say that. It's like, did that just come out of my mouth? Uh-oh. <laughs> but that's Agreed. A Agreed. Yes. Yeah. That's a different story, right? Oh, my goodness. Well, so what yes. are the core skills? Yes, what are the core skills for resilience yeah. in your mind? Yeah, so it's, that's, a, that, that's a great question. And it's really easy for me to launch into this in terms of, I think, what's at the center of my life right now. And one of the things I always tell my executive coaching clients, whether I'm working with them one-on-one or I'm in the middle, in front of a group of people facilitating a workshop, and what I tell them in the beginning of the day or the beginning of the engagement is if you hear me say you should or you need to or you have to, please stop me, interrupt me, throw something at me, whatever it is. <laughs> and I mention that because these core skills come with a grain of salt. Context matters. You know, I'm quoting Todd Cashton from George Mason University, right? Good friend and author of some fantastic books that whatever is important, wherever you are and wherever you find yourself is really, that's where the, the complexity of this comes in, is that you're going to have to find the skills that make the most sense for you at that moment. With that said, I do think there are some core skills Things like psychological flexibility, being able to see things from different points of view and and arguing with yourself, not thinking you're right. I think realistic optimism is a huge – Karen Rivich, her research at the University of Pennsylvania points to optimism being the foundational skill. Uh, and then I also think there's curiosity and mindfulness, which are like in a sense, cousins with each other, uh, very similar things, positive emotions. We just talked about that from, you know, from Barbara Fredrickson and others. And then any discussion around well-being, I think, has to include connection to other human beings. And, and what's also interesting about them is I do think that they can feed each other, right? If we're with people we really like, we experience love and hope and inspiration, which creates positive emotion, which are positive emotions. Right. Which, yeah. And then when we're with other people, we can also get psychological flexibility because they're going to bring us other points of view mm-hmm. or we can bring that to other people, which helps us to connect with other people. So these these have crossover. If you think of a Venn diagram, in a sense, with a bunch of five circles or so, they all do really connect and cross over with each other and they help build on each other. And so would you say that could, if somebody wanted to be to become more resilient? And all of these things are necessary, but maybe not sufficient, any one of them. You know, you kind of need all of them. I'm, I'm guessing, maybe I'm wrong. So, and they all feed off of each other. 
is, is there one that you start with or is it just more like which one do you already have uh, kind of low hanging fruit to, to build on? Or how do you how do you suggest people get started with that? That's a good question. I would say, again, you, your context matters. If I were to just pick some, if I really had to go and give my opinion on what I think the foundational skills are, because that's really just what it is. It's my opinion. I do think mindfulness uh, and curiosity, being open to new experiences, being in the moment without judgment uh, helps you see these other things for what they really are, the connection and the, and also the adversity. Um, and you recognize that in a sense, the adversity is usually not as bad as you thought it was. Mm. Very interesting. Okay. So being mindful and curious rather than judgmental allows you to be open to everything else. I like that. So is that kind of like a keystone habit, would you say? You know, um, I, I bet you probably already are familiar with Charles Duhigg's book, The Power of Habit, and how he defines mm -hmm. um, keystone habits. So I like yes, that idea a absolutely. lot. I love that idea, which um, mm -hmm. he, he says that, you know, all habits are important, but there's some habits that kind of trigger all the other ones to fall into place. This is just for the, for the listeners who may not be familiar with what that means, keystone habit. It's almost like that first domino in a chain of dominoes. You know, when you knock that first domino over, everything else falls, uh, is, is a reaction or triggered by it. So maybe that's... You know, what, you know that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point, Hello. Yeah. I, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but let, let me, uh, you know, give you a quick example, very quick example around how these different skills come in. So I, I started my own business and I was going through a divorce about five years ago. And I have to tell you that uh, at that time, connection probably was the most important thing for me, right? Of those mm -hmm. things, five things I just talked about. So connecting with my friends, going out for dinners, not being at home by myself, right? Uh, I would say probably about a year and a half, two years after that, when I felt connected and I did have a support system in my life, I really started focusing on mindfulness a little bit more. And I went hardcore, right? I started meditating 25, 30 minutes in the morning, five, 10 minutes before I went to bed, uh, wearing a mindfulness bracelet. So I was paying attention to my thoughts and when I was being kind to myself and so forth. You know, now I'm so focused on my work that I have to find time to play so I find great music that I love. I watch comedies with my kids on TV. I make sure that we do something fun every weekend to generate more positive emotions and also more connection. So again, I think um, I'll go back to the, the keystone is a great idea. And I think mindfulness really might be that one, but recognize again, where you find your life, these, what you're, what's needed for you is going to change. Mm. That makes so much sense. I really appreciate that description and thank you for sharing the specific examples from your life because I do think that that helps me get it. I think it probably helps uh, folks listening too. So um, I'm interested in hearing what's new and exciting for you. What's, what's next on, on your horizon? Yeah, thank you for asking. I am uh, in the very early stages of writing a book on resilience. Oh my God. Um, and uh, very excited about it. Uh, even thinking about it, talking about it to other people gets me really excited. And I'm um, in the process of talking to some of the scientists that I mentioned, uh, just doing some quick interviews, bouncing some ideas. I'm, I'm already writing and I'm super excited about uh, getting, you know, what I know from the research and marrying that to my own personal experiences, as I mentioned, as, a, as someone, you know, just who's been on the face of this earth for 46 years, who's a single dad and gone through some adversity of his own in the last five years. And then also just getting some feedback of my coaching clients and the people who sit in our workshops, you know, um, I get some really, really interesting feedback from them. And, and, uh, you know, I want to put that in a, a very practical book that, like I said, has one foot in the science and one foot in wisdom and experience. That sounds awesome. Good for you. A lot of people talk about writing a book, but um, a very small percentage of them actually do it. So, yay, you. <laughs> awesome. Yay. And, and I, I agree. Hey, I can't wait to, to get my hands on it when it's published. That's, that's really fantastic. So um, you, just, you just said something that I think is so important, which is making something practical, right? Because while some people enjoy reading about theory and concepts and abstractions, most people 
either don't find that at all interesting or maybe insufficient. And I find that when I, you know, whenever I'm talking to leaders out there, my clients, you know, workshop participants, people in my audience, when I'm speaking, I can totally tell that they need things that they can actually see themselves doing. And it needs to be broken down into something that's really practical, really applied. And, and that's not too kind of out there, you know, like are you, you're not asking me to, you know, move to, to bed and, and be a monk, you know, I, like it's something I can do tomorrow, right? Um, to be, you know, to be happy, yeah. resilient, or to be a good leader. So since you're writing a book about resilience and since you're very steeped in the research, what would you say is one very actionable suggestion that people that are listening right now could take, at, at, take action on today or this week that you think is going to start really ratcheting up their resilience? What's something really specific and practical? You know, I had a feel, and, and I love the fact that you're asking that question because I am the same way. I want, I don't want to talk theory, although I think it's important for adults to know why they're doing something or why mm -hmm. something's being suggested, which, uh, you know, usually mandates a little bit of theory and research is going to come out there. And I was think I was hoping you'd ask this question and I have to tell you, I'm going to come at this with two answers if you don't mind. Okay. The first is, I think there's a, there's a front door and a back door to resilience. Mm. Okay. The front door is some of these things we've talked about. How do you, how can you change your thought patterns? And that's the mindfulness that's generating more positive emotions, that's connecting with other people on an intimate level. So I'll give you one tip with that one. And I do think um, if you're interested in mindfulness, it doesn't have to be meditation, although I have to tell you, I think it's life changing if you mm -hmm. give it a try and you stick with it. And what I would suggest people do is just download an app for guided meditations. There's tons of free ones out there for both Android and Apple, yeah. uh, at least that I know of, uh, for those two operating systems. And it will guide you through this, and it can be absolutely life-changing. If you don't feel like giving that a try, simply get one of those bracelets, those colored bla bra you know, rubber band bracelets that everybody has, and practice mindfulness during the course of the day. So if you are having unkind thoughts, maybe you've got a coworker who's really, you know, not nice to you or other people. Mm. And every time you have an unkind thought about that person, you just simply move the band from one hand to the other. And it's just, a, it's not about judging yourself and punishing yourself. Like you're not taking this and snapping your wrist, <laughs> right? You're just moving it. You're just moving it. Okay, so that's that's one simple tip. The other the other uh, side of this is the back door to resilience. So so hang on for and a second. The back door to resilience. Let me let me interrupt you for a second, just so that I'm really clear. So you're sure. moving just to just sort yeah. of the, the the pragmatics of it. So you're moving the band yes. from one wrist to the other, and and then you do what? Like do you mm -hmm. think about? Do you say something to yourself? What are you doing? You're simply calling it to your attention. That's mm -hmm. it. Okay. And what happens is, you know, and the, I'll give you a quick example. I had a coaching client who was trying to invest in mindfulness and he was becoming aware of how he was cutting other people off and he was raising his voice and other things. And he said to me one day, you know, Doug, this is starting to work, but I'm hitting a little bit of a wall. And I, like he goes, I, you know, the other day I, I, I yelled at my two-year-old daughter and then I cut someone off in a meeting and, you know, then I yelled at, um, I yelled at my um, VP of sales. And I'm like, gosh, what a jerk I am. I, I can't believe I blow. And he went on for a couple of minutes railing against himself. And I said, you know, mindfulness starts with being kind to yourself. Oh yeah. And I said, and that's when I said, every time you find yourself saying, oh, I can't believe how stupid I am, or I can't believe I just did that, and you're judging yourself, just switch the band from one hand to the other. That's it. Just be aware of it. And, the, and it's the awareness that allows you to then change the behavior. Okay, I get it. Thank you. Thanks for that. I just sure. wasn't to totally clear. Okay, so I interrupted you. We we're just yeah. talking about interruptions. I, I, no. do, that. I do that a lot. Um, so you were going to talk about the back door. So go for it. Yeah, so by the way, it was a good interruption because I, I was going too fast. The, the back door to resilience has a whole bunch of things uh, that can fit in through that door as well. One of them is living and working in your strengths. And by the way, it's viacharacter.org if you want to go take a free test. It's 120 questions. 
Uh, it's not my website, um, yeah. but it's uh, steeped in the research. And Marty Seligman, who we mentioned before, and Chris Peterson uh, were the lead researchers on that one. So yeah. living and working in your strengths. Uh, the other, but the other thing is so basic. If I were really to talk to anybody, I'm not a nutrition expert. I'm not a physical health expert. Get the right amount of sleep. Get a little bit of exercise, and then invest in eating like fruits and vegetables and good food because those things. If if your body's not right, it's really hard for the mind to be right. Mm. Cool. I like that, and of course, there's absolutely no downside to that <laughs> that I can think of. Uh, uh, yeah, but it can create agreed. more resilience, right? Because it allows you to become uh, stronger and maybe primes you to be able to handle stuff when it comes your way. Absolutely. Awesome. I love that. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate that you shared. So you we got two for the price of one, which is such a great bargain. <laughs> why you're listening to this podcast, right? <laughs> So, um, yeah, there you go. People, how can people stay in touch with you? I'm going to obviously, I'm going to link in the show notes to everything that we've mentioned so far. We talked about discover your strengths and, and the via strengths assessment, which is one of my favorite tools. And, um, and, and of course your website. So where, where can people stay in touch and, uh, what would you like them to know about getting in touch with you? Yeah, sure. So, uh, the website, uh, our, our, consulting website is drh douglas richard hinch dash group.com and if you click on the blog uh i do a, a monthly blog at this point uh, i'm going to pick that up a little bit and i just review a book once a month because i read so much and i enjoy learning i decided to start sharing it and you can sign up for the newsletter on there as well so you can just get it pushed to you the other place that I think is really good for people where I, I'm active, but it's also uh, you're going to get some community benefit is on LinkedIn. We've got a uh, I started a group about six or seven years ago called Positive Psychology Professionals. Oh. And uh, there are almost 17,000 members in the group now. And there's all types of articles that are submitted every day and great discussions by some really smart people. And what I'll tell you is I approve every person that comes in. I also approve every new article. So it's, there's no spam in there. There's no, uh, and I kick people out <laughs> if they start promoting their services or trying to recruit people. Uh, and it's a, I think it's a great place to uh, learn about positive psychology. That is awesome. I can't believe I didn't know about that. I am going, as soon as we uh, finish this recording, I am going to join you and I hope that you will not kick me out. Very cool. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, well, Doug, it's been fun talking to you and I'm really glad that I'm able to share some of your brilliance with the folks that are listening. I appreciate that you took the time today to share it and I hope that everyone will go check out your website, your blog, your newsletter, your LinkedIn group, and everything that we've shared. And um, take that one or two actions uh, that can help you become more resilient. Doug, make it a great day. Thanks, Lily. I hope that you recognize that being resilient is one of those things we all need to work on mastering. It's not very easy, but life is so full of turmoil and change that it is one of those skills that is extremely important, both for ourselves and also for the people that are on our team. So I hope that you take Doug's suggestions to heart and take action on them because action on goals is the only way to make progress and improve. And as always, thank you for tuning in. Please Give me any kind of suggestions or questions or comments in the comments below on the show notes page, which is at www.talentgrow.com forward slash podcast forward slash episode 12. And until the next time, make today great. Thanks for listening to the Talent Grow Show where we help you develop your talent to become the kind of leader that people want to follow. For more information, visit talentgrow.com.